This is a one of a kind. He's the unique of the unique. He was probably blessed with the greatest left arm that anybody in the world ever had. The most God-given ability of any one pitcher that I've ever had. I threw harder than anyone I've ever seen and was wilder than anyone I've ever seen. <laughs> Grab your helmets, run behind buildings because this guy throws unguided missiles and he doesn't know where they're going. But he's the only pitcher in the history of baseball who hit a scout in a concession stand. Dalkowski's ball was just always jumping. It was alive, it was sparkling, it was electric. If you were to take that and put it on a radar gun today, I think that you'd probably see where Dalkowski threw the ball, maybe 110, maybe 115 miles an hour. I don't think there's anybody, been anybody like Steve Dalkowski. Somebody who was, who was almost myth and legend. These revealing testimonials set the scene for reliving the astounding tale of an extraordinary life story. It starts with a young man growing up as a high school sports hero to seeing his life and dreams come crashing down to finally being proclaimed a legendary cult figure by the time of his passing in April 2020. This is where and when that lifetime of myths and legends began. Nineteen fifties, New Britain, Connecticut, the God fearing, exhaustively hard working Polish American mill town. Each spring, fathers and sons turned to baseball, their souls to be resurrected with the game's eternal hope and optimism. It was America's pastime and a future filled with dreams. One local father, Steve Dalkowski Sr., had played semi pro ball. Now he pulled the seven to three shift at the tool and die plant up the street from the Corbin Heights housing project where his family lived. He couldn't wait to initiate his son, Steve Jr., in this springtime rite of passage. His sister Patty remembers, the family threw themselves behind Steve's ball-playing ambition. We all went. We watched as he progressed and got better and better and better. His main stage was New Britain High's Walnut Hill Field. He was hell on the pitcher's mound. Some say his dad pushed Steve hard. But Andy Baylock, former University of Connecticut baseball coach, says Steve Sr. actually worried about young Steve's fastball. His dad really kind of put the reins on. I mean, Steve pitched, but Steve was a position player. Steve was an athlete. And his dad had a feeling, too, about, you know, hold back on the, on the throwing, and, you know, which is something a lot of people do now. Steve's powerful arm could even throw a football, standing flat-footed through goalposts halfway down the field. In 1955, as a junior quarterback, Steve led New Britain High School to a state championship and a season-ending game in Miami's Orange Bowl. He and his family were tasting success. But baseball was where an arm of Steve's strength might turn pro one day, like his dad had dreamed. Steve's fastball had a terrifying rising speed. The first game he ever pitched for me, he struck out 15 batters and I believe walked 13. He could get the ball over the plate at times, However, he was a little wild. Over three seasons at New Britain High, Dalkowski struck out 313 batters, but with 180 walks. Despite his wildness, he did have some good ball games. He holds the Connecticut strikeout record. For high schools in a nine inning game, he struck out 24 batters in one game. Major League scouts came to see, well, hear, Steve's whizzing pitches noise kept going by us and I finally said dad what is that noise it was like a whiz when my brother was pitching behind us and that's where it started with the radio pitch because you can hear it but you couldn't see it his senior year there were just scouts galore when it got down to he really was going to play baseball they really came like every day a different one came and um, they came for supper they called on the phone it was high school graduation day in 1957 and pro scouts had limousines lined up in front of the Dalkowski's Governor Street home in the projects. He and his parents decided that they would sign with the Baltimore Orioles. I'm Frank McGowan who signed my brother who was a super person. He rode with him to Knoxville on the train and said Steve never said a word the whole way down. He was very quiet, very, very much to himself, but there was a lot in there. On June 26th, Steve made his minor league debut his first pro start came four days later. The Kingsport Times News called the effort a nightmare, adding, he didn't get a single man out. But what happened the next day in Kingsport in a game against the Bluefield Dodgers would strike fear at opposing batters for the rest of Steve's career. Batter Bob Beavers didn't see Steve's lightning fast pitch until it was too late. It beamed Bob in the side of the head, ripping his ear he had to be rushed to the hospital. 
Beavers would never play the game again. Would Steve one day kill a man in the batter's box? Dowkowski cocked his arm and released the ball. The ball hit the peak of the cap and spun it around on my head. My brains could have been scrambled eggs right there at home plate. I never saw the pitch. Frank Zuppa, one of Dowko's minor league catchers, remembers Steve, a legend in the making. I could sit here and talk for an hour about this. We were playing in Stockton. And we walked out of the clubhouse, and there was some money bet that he couldn't throw a ball from, I don't remember if it was from home plate or the pitcher's mount over the center field wall. He didn't even warm up, picked the ball up out of the bag, and threw it from home plate at the top of the clubhouse. That was 410 feet away. This personal lore grew into professional news about the phenom. Former major leaguer Dalton Jones was quoted about Steve's pitch that hearing him warm up on the sidelines was like a gun going off. Dalkowski takes the baseball into the realm of being a deadly weapon. The ball hit the umpire's mask straight on. It broke in three pieces. On April 13th, 1958, 18-year-old Dalkowski was showcased in an exhibition game against the Cincinnati Reds at Baltimore's Memorial Stadium in front of a crowd of 7,868 fans, including his parents. In just 12 pitches, Steve struck out the side and left to a standing ovation. Steve still had to earn his stripes in the minors from 1958 to 1962. More incredible performances were tempered by equally erratic bouts of wildness. Other Orioles prized pitching prospects made steady progress to the club's big league roster as part of its baby birds core of strong arms. None though were more fabled than Steve. Under manager Earl Weaver in 1962 with the Elmira New York Pioneers, Steve's career stabilized. He delivered his best season. In the second half of it, in over 52 innings, he struck out 104 batters and walked but 11. It seemed like everything was coming together for Steve. That progress earned Dalco another invite to the Major League Club's 1963 spring training camp in Miami. Six long years after signing with the Orioles, Steve had at last blossomed into a pro. He was fitted for his first major league uniform. He had arrived big time. As the exhibition season neared its end, Steve entered as a reliever in a March 22nd game in Miami against the visiting New York Yankees. Steve unleashes one of his signature lightning speed pitches. At that moment, a pop was heard and not in the catcher's glove. Orioles teammate Boog Powell recalls. I was playing uh, first base at that time, and he was trying to get a little bit extra on the slider to Roger Maris, and I heard his elbow pop. Steve grows quiet. He tries to throw two more pitches, but Orioles pitching coach Harry Burkeen senses something is wrong. Harry steps out to Steve's mound. He has Steve try a test pitch toward home plate. It flies 15 feet wide, hitting the backstop. In 1964, Burkeen was tasked with rebuilding Steve's injured arm, but his fastball had slowed and his psyche and confidence were damaged. He still threw the ball quite well, but people who had seen him before and could compare, they said, you know, he's just a shadow of himself as far as the great legend of the tremendous fastball that he had possessed a few years before. Steve sputtered around Orioles farm teams, but the club finally decides to release him. He was reassigned to the Los Angeles Angels San Jose Bees Class A team in 1965. It was Steve's last stop on his baseball journey. On May 7, 1966, the Sporting News, Baseball's Bible, announces living legend released. You still regretted the fact that from what you had heard about how hard he could throw and to realize that this might be the end of his career. That did hurt, and it was difficult. And then whenever you release a player, you try to encourage him and try to say the right things that might prepare him for post-career. And, and then when you hear some of the tragedy and, and tragic stories concerning Dalkowski, you know, it still hurts. Steve's career was over at 26 years old. The Sporting News' next story reported his whereabouts unknown. Could Steve prove Thomas Wolfe wrong? Could he go home again? Dark alleys, cardboard boxes, and migrant work called his name. But could love? Who was Virginia? And whatever happened to his first fan, 
his beloved sister, Patty. Dalkowski, you know, the fall was precipitous and it was, it was a deep one. And I think it just shows the degree to which he was really broken by the fact that he could not do the, the, the thing for which everyone seemed to respect him. Baseball was Dalkowski's life. It was his identity. It's what got him out of New Britain. And now he no longer had it. That was the time that I saw him at his lowest. His way of showing that he lost interest was to get completely reckless and not care about anything. I mean, when you, I don't mean lose control, but when you lose that aim or that, that, that desire to play ball, it was like everything else was just the hell with it. I was in a daze, you know? I don't know which way to turn, I tell you. And so, he disappeared. He found his way to the other side of the country in California's Central Valley. After a brief marriage, he settled in with migrant workers, sleeping in alleys, garbage cans, and sometimes jail. But we all very, you know, wanted to follow his career and how he was doing and so forth, and, uh, and, and to see some of the things that happened to him, it hurt. Fact is, we'll never know exactly what happened in those years, other than he'd make enough money working in the fields to quench his thirst and then be out there the next day, or perhaps in lockup for alcohol-related offenses. And that friends stepped in to help. Former teammate Ray Youngdahl, who was a probation officer, got him enrolled in alcohol treatment programs between 1973 and 78 and lined him up with a landscaping job. But the sobriety didn't last. He didn't have coaching. He didn't have life coaching. He didn't have alcohol coaching. He didn't have medical coaching. And he didn't have pitching coaching. Someone who can relate is former major leaguer Ryan Durant, the subject of Charlie Sheen's Wild Thing character in David Ward's film Major League. He not only lived the baseball life, but was a counselor who worked with alcoholics. We had an alcohol mentality uh, around it. And uh, uh, if you weren't a part of that, then uh, there wasn't a sense of belonging. And I'm sure that uh, uh, an awful lot of Steve's drinking like mine was uh, a, an assertion of our masculinity and our, and our need to belong. Dalkowski's pension for having a good time led him to desperate lows, but also to great highs. Virginia Greenwood didn't know he was a former baseball prodigy when she saw him at the rundown rooming house run by her mother, but she liked him. He just seemed like he'd be fun to be with, you know. He was, really. <laughs> we had a lot of fun together. The two were married in Las Vegas in 1975. One morning about 5 o'clock, well, I picked him up and we drove to Las Vegas and got married. Brother, that was a mistake. I know. <laughs> but back home, his family had lost touch with him and he with them. While in California, Dalkowski loses both his parents. He returns to New Britain for his father's funeral in 1978, but not his mother's in 1987. Friends and media members searched for him, but he was well hidden at the bottom of a bottle. But in the early 90s, little did Steve know that help was on its way. That help came in the form of one of Steve's true friends and his former catcher Zupo and a documentary film crew. I don't want to break the camera now. The impetus to search for Dalco came about by a chance meeting at Baltimore's Memorial Stadium. So really through Frank uh, being able for us to find Steve and then ultimately go out and uh, be able to, um, to talk with him, that's really where my 30-year uh, journey started at that Orioles Old Timers, which would have been 1990. When they arrived in Oildale, California in August 1991, they found Dalkowski deeply damaged from his longtime alcohol abuse problem that had ravaged his body, brain, and whole being. A day to sober up enabled Steve to finally let out what he hadn't shared with anyone about his feelings on all that he had been through and what his down on his luck life had become since his baseball career ended. When I hurt my arm, I just, like that, I went further down. I walked the streets, my man. Walked them night after night, but I still, uh, I don't remember, I don't forget them days, man, when I, I slept in alleys. I fell asleep in a garbage can and they dumped me almost in the thing. I jumped, yeah, because I, I covered up with the paper. They taught me how to do that, them guys. There was no vacancy there, the guy said. 
So what? No vacancy. It's a hole in the wall. So I've been here for all winter. There's a place down there. Try that garbage camp. I'm ashamed of uh, just going down the drain and I and I don't have to do that. Just stop this Mickey Mouse drinking stuff. Maybe get my act together. You know I really hurt the most? God bless the soul of my family. Especially my sister and the kids, you know. And uh, my wife and her kids. And I cry a lot at night. Yeah. Too bad, you know. I had everything on the platter, you know. I just dumped it in the toilet, and I guess I flushed it. When Steve was finished, Frank asked him and Virginia if they wanted help with his drinking issues. They consented. Frank was able to get the baseball assistance team, BAT, to get him treatment in a Los Angeles hospital for three months and then set up in a halfway house called the Rickman Center. Then on August 1st, 1992, he just walked out the door and never came back. He went back to the streets he knew so well. Virginia heard nothing. She took to the written word to express what she was feeling. December 17, 1992. Tom, I would like to thank you for having the tapes made for me. I may have to wait until after the holidays to watch it. I don't think I can handle it right now. I miss him not being here for Christmas because he liked to help decorate and liked a lot of presents under the tree. It's going to be especially hard for me until after the first of the year. We went out together New Year's Eve 1970 for the first time. I just hope and pray he is all right. Thanks again, Virginia. One week later, a miracle occurred on Christmas Eve. Steve was found in a laundromat in Glendale, California by a couple named Martinez. They found a scrap of paper in his pocket with Frank Zuppo's phone number on it. They didn't even know Steve. They just saw this poor soul sitting there on Christmas Eve and brought him home. I'm very lucky because I have him back. For Patty, the fates, not luck, and her long-held belief in him was what finally brought Steve home. After Steve was reunited with Virginia in Oklahoma City, where she had moved to be with her family, their time together was short as she died from a stroke a year later. Dalco spent two months in the hospital there to prepare for his trip back to New Britain in March 1994. Patty arranged to have him placed in the Walnut Hill Care Center, just a short distance from where he starred on the baseball field at the nearby park. Now 54 years old, Steve reveled in the chance to finally visit with old friends and recapture some of his past. He attended his 50th high school reunion and New Britain High baseball and football games. Still suffering from the effects of alcohol dementia, through sobriety and medical care, Dalkowski's health began to improve. Life was getting good again for Steve. Being home suited Dalkowski well. He was elected to the New Britain Sports Hall of Fame in 2000. As one of its greatest hometown heroes, he had earned his rightful place in joining the sports lore of his birthplace. That summer, Steve was invited by an old high school friend named Coleman Levy, who owned the class AA New Britain Rockets, to toss out the first pitch at the team's New Britain Stadium. It was Steve's triumphant return to have his loyal following of fans see him on his home turf once again with a baseball in his hand. Nobody in baseball could forget about the kid who once possessed the most electric arm in the game, the Baltimore Orioles, the organization where Steve had spent almost his entire pro career, invited him to be recognized at Oriole Park at Camden Yards in 2003 for a pregame luncheon. That was followed by Dalco throwing out the ceremonial first pitch back on a major league mound in Baltimore for the first time since his memorable 1958 appearance. A drifting road once paved with heartbreak, darkness, and an ongoing battle with alcohol was seemingly being cleared by the baseball angels and Dalkowski was enjoying his time in the spotlight. 
Lots of fan mail arrived with constant requests for autographs, photos, and balls to be signed that kept him busy and provided a needed spark of life. Steve's high profile continued to soar as he made his way through his newfound life. When the Bull Durham baseball film was replayed on cable TV, Ron Shelton's Ebby Nuke Lelouch character, primarily based on Steve, shone an even brighter spotlight on him. In 2009, Dalkowski met Shelton for the first time when he was inducted into the baseball reliquary Shrine of the Eternals in Pasadena, California. Shelton introduced Delkowski at the ceremony, which honored him for the imprint he made on the landscape of baseball. Steve's trip to Southern California took a symbolic turn for his life. For Steve, that really completed a circle for him because you know, his downfall started when he left the Rickman Center in Los Angeles, and then he was able to go back and be honored. One of his greatest honors, hopefully maybe wiped out, maybe one of his most terror, terrorizing parts of his life where he went back to the streets. And a therapeutic return to another major league ballpark was just the right medicine to help extinguish those ghosts of the past. What well, better place than Dodger Stadium to throw out a first pitch in front of a big crowd. The legend of Steve Dalkowski kept growing and growing. Once gifted by the gods with a fastball that vaporized hitters, Steve finally was afforded his long-awaited day in the sun when he was featured in the acclaimed documentary film Fastball in 2015. With all due respect to Thomas Wolfe, you really can go home again. Dalkowski found his own level of happiness in his 26 years back in New Britain. It was where he was born and raised, became a legend, but also where he died at the age of 80 of complications from the coronavirus. At the time of his death, the final tributes from media around the country poured in. With regard to celebrating the life of a minor league baseball player, the most poignant memorialization that captured Steve's mythical place in our culture and sports history came from an unlikely source, the National Review. Dalkowski was baseball's last truly legendary figure, the author Dan McLaughlin wrote. Innumerable amazing stories were told about him and we'll never know how many of them were true, but he was such a larger than life figure, outsized talent and outsized flaws, that it's not really possible to dismiss them. In an era of mass media and a sport where everything is being recorded and quantified, there is little room left for legend. Dalkowski was the last of his kind. While Dalko was all that and more to the outside world, he was also just Stevie to his loving and loyal kid sister, Patty, estranged from him for so long. When he left, it was like he went into another world. Um, and the, the only real contact we had as to what was going on was through the papers. He very rarely called to say what was going on because I think we go back to, he felt that the city of New Britain expected more than he can really give. She was his guardian angel, his number one fan biggest advocate, staunchest defender, and she was all the family Dalkowski had left. When he was doing what he was doing, he was the best. People, when I read these articles, forget that the reason that they're writing about a person that played baseball and is an alcoholic because he was the best at what he did when he was playing baseball, and so the only thing that they can expand on and to make it juicier is the fact that he drank a lot. Always by his side, Patty was on call 24-7 whenever Steve needed someone to boost him back up. Now at my age, I can look back and see that there were a lot of things that were going on in his mind that was covered up by his drinking. Drinking was part of life, not necessarily for a 15-year-old, but he just fell into it. And having her big brother back with her for 26 years was something she never imagined would ever happen. But it did. As she told a newspaper reporter years later, when he got off the plane from Oklahoma, we didn't know what to expect. He was in bad shape. It was touch and go. And we didn't think he would live very long. But he fooled us. Yes, Steve, as he always did, lived his life defying the status quo and confounding those closest to him. But his life was very real. Sure, it was filled with hard to believe, grandly embellished stories, 
but also built solidly upon facts from his mound exploits. Well, in his case, you have the statistics. <laughs> and the statistics cannot be argued with, you know, in, in, in Steve's case. They are overwhelming. They're so overwhelming that I had to modify them in Bull Durham for Nucleouche because nobody would believe the real ones. In some ways, the statistics do define him and mean that the legend, you know, it's the old thing from the John Ford movie, you know, when the legend's better than the truth, print the legend. Well, in his case, you've got the facts to back up the legend. The facts, plus his immense talent, solidified his mystique. Had Steve Delkowski ever been able, able to saddle his talents, Steve Dalkowski was going to the Hall of Fame. The undeniable notoriety and media attention that resulted from that career built his subsequent legendary status in the soul of our sports culture and beyond. Steve's fabled story was trumpeted far and wide, remarkably sometimes alongside many of the greatest athletes of our generation, even recognized through caricatures in art and on the silver screen. And what kept him alive on the hard road he traveled was his zestful spirit and fun-filled manner in which he lived his life that elevated him to these lofty heights. And one thing that surely is not myth or legend is that Steve Dalkowski will never be accused of not living life to its fullest during his remarkable 80 years on Earth.